Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady. You're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about jellyfish today, shall we? And I know I said in my last two videos that this video was going to be about jellyfish and also sea anemones, but I had to cut out sea anemones because I just ran out of time. Researching jellyfish took a lot longer than I thought it would, and I made the foolish mistake of thinking that they were similar enough animals to each other that I could say one thing about jellyfish and it would apply to sea anemones, and that's just wrong. That was wrong. I don't know why I thought that. So, I'm sorry, sea anemones. You're not gonna be in this video. Oh, come on, man. Don't look at me like that. Also, I know we're not supposed to use the word jellyfish anymore. We're supposed to call them sea jellies, because jellyfish aren't fish. And I get why we're trying to move away from this word. Jellyfish don't have a backbone or scales or eyes or really anything that fish have. But I'm going to be honest. I really don't like using this term. I'm okay with the word jelly when it's used when talking about a specific species. Like, I'm okay with calling these moon jellies. But for some reason, I think sea jellies sounds dumb. So I'm just gonna be stubborn and keep calling them jellyfish. If you got a problem with that, then come at me, you filthy grammar police! I ain't scared of you, ag cab motherfucker. Anyway, jellyfish are part of the phylum Cnidaria, which is a huge phylum and contains a bunch of other animals, including, uh, this is a little awkward, sea anemones? But also sea pens, corals, yes, all of them, and hydrozoans, like the Portuguese man-o-war. And to really quickly clarify, contrary to I think somewhat popular belief, Portuguese man-o-war are not jellyfish, they're just hydrozoans. Well, okay, actually, I get why someone would call a Portuguese man-o-war a jellyfish, and just because you're a hydrozoan doesn't automatically mean you're not a jellyfish, but all right, this is where stuff gets complicated. Okay, so there's this subphylum in Cnidaria, Medusozoa. In Medusozoa, there are four classes, Cubozoa, Starozoa, Scyphozoa, and Hydrozoa. A lot of animals that you and I would call a jellyfish are found in these groups. Three out of the four even have that word in their common name, box jellyfish, stocked jellyfish, and... <sighs> true jellyfish. Some people argue that an animal can only be a jellyfish if they're part of Scyphozoa, as you can tell by their common name, but as usual, I am not here for this elitism garbage, and we are not leaving box jellyfish out of this discussion. That is preposterous. But for a long time, I basically subscribed to the idea that animals who were part of these groups were jellyfish, and animals who were part of this one were not. This is mostly because the hydrozoans I knew about looked like this, and this doesn't look very jellyfish-like to me. But then I saw this hydrozoan, and this hydrozoan, and this one, and this one, and they did look like jellyfish to me. They look more like a jellyfish to me than this, and this is a starozoan, a stocked jellyfish. The problem here is there really isn't a scientific definition of what a jellyfish is. It's a word non-scientists use to talk about creatures that are basically bell-shaped, have tentacles hanging off of them, a body made out of a jelly-like substance, and are free swimming. When scientists are talking about these animals, they usually just say the class name of the animal they're talking about, or they add jellyfish at the end. But this is the important part of that phrase. This part doesn't really matter. This takes me back to what I was saying about the Portuguese man of war. Most marine biologists I know would say that this technically isn't a jellyfish because it's a hydrozoan, but I also don't think it's unreasonable for an average person to look at one and be like, hey, a jellyfish. I've seen plenty of people call these jellyfish too, and they're in a completely different phylum. I called them jellyfish a few days ago, didn't even think about it. So what is the actual definition of a jellyfish? I don't know. In the deepest corners of your heart, what do you want a jellyfish to be? Whatever you come up with, I probably won't argue about it much, unless you say something like this is a jellyfish because then there's obviously going to be words. But for the purpose of this video, when I say the word jellyfish, I am mostly going to be talking about animals that are in the subphylum Medusozoa and look like a variation of this. There are going to be exceptions, but if I talk about them all, we're going to be here all day. So just pretend I'm saying in general every time I make a statement about jellyfish, okay? Okay. Moving on, jellyfish are really old we think. We're pretty sure that jellyfish were one of the first multicellular animals to exist. It's just, you know, unsurprisingly, jellyfish aren't great at fossilizing. And when we do find a fossil that might be a jellyfish, there seems to be a lot of contention over the identification of it. Take a look at this fossil, for example. This is Olivoides is how I think you pronounce it. According to the paper that this picture is from, people have been arguing about what this fossil is for literally decades. It was interpreted as a fossil embryo in the 90s, proposed as a coronate scyphozoan, which is just a fancy way to say jellyfish in 97, and then again in 99. Later reinterpreted as an echinoderm in 2004, then a cubozoan in 2016, then a stem group cyclo neuralian in 2014 then a oh boy diploblastic stem group you you met you met a zoan in 2013 
<sighs> okay, this same paper, which came out in 2017, seems to lean towards this fossil being a Scyphozoan jellyfish, which I'm just gonna go with that. I'm not gonna jump into this hot mess. So that means that jellyfish are from the Fortunian period, which makes them somewhere between 529 to 541 million years old. Jellyfish are over half a billion years old, which for context makes them the oldest animal I've talked about on alien ocean so far, beating out horseshoe crabs by at least 50 million years. Jellyfish are found all over the world and much like barnacles, there's no real point in highlighting where. From the deepest depths to the shallowest waters, you can find jellyfish somewhere. There are first plankton on the alien ocean, which is basically any organism that can't swim against a current, so jellyfish get pushed all over the world, whether they want to be or not. That doesn't mean that all species of jellyfish can survive anywhere in the world. They are very sensitive to temperature and salinity changes. And if you want to know more about the exciting world of salinity, check out my last video. But their planktonic nature essentially explains how jellyfish manage to spread across the planet. Jellyfish also have surprisingly complicated life cycles, with both asexual and an asexual stage. They're capable of sexual reproduction in their medusa stage, which is this stage. It's the stage where a jellyfish most looks like a jellyfish. After male and female jellyfish reproduce through broadcast spawning, which we learned about in my barnacles video, the fertilized eggs eventually become planula, little planktonic larvae that swim around until they find a place to settle. Once they attach to something, they grow into their asexual stage and become a polyp called a scyphostoma. And then they grow into a strobila, which then strobilates a form of asexual reproduction where segments of the strobila pop off and become free swimming. These are now Ephyra, juvenile medusae. They then grow into adult medusae or adult jellyfish and the whole cycle starts all over again. And the anatomy of an adult jellyfish is sort of famously simple. Here, come here, come look. This right here, that's their stomach or their cylinderon. This right here is their mouth and also their anus. These are their tentacles, and all this stuff is their mesoglia, which is a buoyant gelatinous tissue that gives jellyfish their jelliness. No brains, just some nerve nets. They got gonads somewhere, and that's it. That's that's kind of it for jellyfish. It's a little bit strange if you think about it. Anecdotally, jellyfish are one of the reasons most cited to me about why people are too scared to go swim in the ocean, but jellyfish are just... They're just a bag of goo. And they're only just barely bags of goo because jellyfish are like 97% water. But of course, I'm neglecting to talk about one of the things that makes jellyfish famous or infamous. They're stings. Ooh, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. Let's talk about cnidocytes, y'all. Okay, so cnidocytes are a type of cell found in all cnidarians. So whether you're a sea pen, a jellyfish, a coral, or whatever, you got cnidocytes somewhere on your body. There are three different kinds of cnidocytes, nematocytes, tycocytes, and spirocytes. But jellyfish only have nematocytes, so we're only gonna talk about those. Tycocytes are found in certain tube-dwelling anemones, while spirocytes are found in like, like, uh, like, like regular sea anemones. Do you seriously have to sit there and stare at me like that? Within the nematocyte, there is a nematocyst. And yes, this is confusingly named. Honestly, I didn't understand the difference between them until I started doing research for this video. I'm pretty sure I've been using them as synonyms of each other since college. So the nematocyst is an organelle. It's a structure inside of a cell. And that cell, the whole cell, is called a nematocyte. Nematocyst, nematocyte. Nematocyst, nematocyte. Part of the cell, all of the cell. Part of the cell, all of the cell. It would be kind of like calling a chair and inside your house a cherocyst and your house a cherocyte. I feel like there's a better comparison I can make here. Nematocytes are mostly found in the tentacles of jellyfish, but sometimes jellyfish will line their stomach with them in case prey tries to start some trouble after it's been eaten. The nematocyst sits coiled up inside of the cell until it gets triggered, and when it does, the nematocyst is flooded with water. And since its walls are very thick, the increase in water doesn't cause it to swell or rupture. Instead, the influx of water creates a ton of hydrostatic pressure that causes the nematocyst to fire. An actual hinged lid called an operculum flings open. The nematocyst launches itself into the skin or shell of whatever the jellyfish bumped into, punching a hole in it, it then forces a tubule deep into the flesh of their victim, which releases a bunch of venom. Nematocysts are, in effect, a harpoon with a hypodermic needle attached at the end, and it's all stuffed into the most nightmarish jack-in-the-box imaginable. And all of this can happen in less than three milliseconds, which is one of the fastest cellular movements ever recorded. This completely destroys the nematocyte, though, so a new one will need to be grown to replace it. To make sure that the nematocysts aren't firing off willy-nilly every time a jellyfish brushes up against, like, a rock, they need to have a combination of both a physical and chemical trigger in order for the nematocyst to fire. Nematocysts are highly sensitive to vibrations at certain frequencies, possibly because their prey, uh, vibes at these particular frequencies when they swim around, and they're also sensitive to certain sugars and amino acids found in mucus. Interestingly, exposure to different chemicals can actually change the frequencies that nematocysts are sensitive to, perhaps as a way to tune the cell to be more sensitive to a certain type of prey, which is all pretty complex stuff for a creature that's a barely there bag of goo. 
And quick PSA, most jellyfish are harmless to humans, but some have painful stings that can result in rashes, and some species have venom so deadly that it can kill you in just a few minutes. If you're swimming in an area that's known for having dangerous jellyfish around, pay attention to signage, and wearing a wetsuit can help protect you against stings. But if you do get stung by a jellyfish, for goodness sake, do not pee on it. Urine is filthy, and a jellyfish sting is an open wound filled with venom. Don't do it, it's going to make everything worse. As for what you should do if you get stung by a jellyfish, all the information I could find on it was very contradictory, so I'm not going to make any recommendations here and run the risk of getting sued. Now with all that said, I want to talk about some specific species of jellyfish for no real reason. I just think they're neat. Or because I want to dispel some myths about them. Like, for example, this is a lion's mane jellyfish. It's one of the biggest species of jellyfish in the world. This, which I've seen go viral way too many times, is a photoshopped picture of a lion's mane jellyfish. It's not real. At maybe their biggest, lion's mane jellyfish can get to be a little over two meters in diameter. Their tentacles can get super long. The longest recorded was about 36 meters. But this picture is just... no. No! Next jellyfish I want to talk about is the immortal jellyfish, which yeah, might be an animal that can live forever. When put under stressful situations like starvation, temperature, or salinity changes, or physical damage to their body, adult immortal jellyfish in their medusa stage can switch back to their juvenile polyp stage. And then they can just hang out as a polyp until they decide to grow into an adult medusa again. And what's particularly interesting about the immortal jellyfish is that there are other species of jellyfish that can switch back into the polyp phase, but it's usually when they're in the ephyra stage, so this one. There are others that can switch back when they've reached their adult medusa stage, but haven't reached sexual maturity yet. But the immortal jellyfish can reach sexual maturity and still switch back to being a juvenile polyp. And this is not a simple process. They need to completely rearrange their tissues, create completely new cell types that don't exist in the adult stage. And to quote this paper, this process would be hardly more remarkable if a butterfly were able to revert to its caterpillar stage. And one of the stressful situations that can trigger the reversal of aging in immortal jellyfish is senescence, which is deterioration due to age, which means these these jellyfish can feel when they're getting old and it stresses them out so they switch back to being a juvenile polyp again and this is a cycle that can go on in theory forever which is why they're called the immortal jellyfish and talking about this now is making me reflect on my own mortality and I need to stop before I have an existential crisis. Finally, I wanted to talk about Stygiomedusa gigantea, or the giant phantom jellyfish. It went viral a couple weeks ago and you can't really blame him. Look at this dapper gentleman. He looks like he's wearing a bowler hat. My creative consultant said he looks like a pair of ripped pantyhose, which... Why do I ever ask for his opinion on anything? Apparently it used to be called Stygio Medusa Fabulosa, and we should really reconsider changing its name back to that. But anyway, Stygio Medusa Gigantia has only been seen about 110 times in 110 years, so not a lot is known about it. We know that it's found all over the world, except for maybe the Arctic, and they've been found at depths of up to 6,665 meters. Back in 2006, an ROV got some footage of one, and this paper compiled all the frames of the video into one big picture. So this is what the jellyfish would look like if it was all stretched out and they calculate that the arms of the jellyfish to be about 5.8 meters long and a bell size of about 0.73 meters wide. But the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, or MBARI, estimates that the S. gigantea that they got on their recent video had arms up to 10 meters long with a bell over one meter across. S. gigantea also lacks the tentacles seen around the margins of a jellyfish's bell, they only have them around their mouth, and it's hypothesized that the reason why their tentacles are so broad and flat and ribbony is so that it can catch prey kind of like flypaper. And it's also hypothesized that digestion happens in the arms. Some, somehow. It's kind of hard to tell, but in the same picture, there's a deep sea fish called Thalassobathia pelagica, or the pelagic brodula, or brutula. Not sure how to pronounce that. They've been seen hanging out around S. gigantea, swimming into and out of its oral arms, and researchers think that since the deep sea doesn't have a lot of places to hide, some fish like to take shelter in the bodies of big gelatinous animals like S. gigantea. And that's all the information I could find out about this guy. I could genuinely talk about jellyfish for hours. This was actually one of the more frustrating scripts I've had to write for Alien Ocean. Like, seriously, all this script almost killed me because there was a decent amount of research I left out so this wouldn't turn into an absolute tome of a video. But from their cells to their life cycles, jellyfish are deceptively simple animals with surprisingly complex everything. Thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean, and man, shout out to my old invertebrate zoology textbook from college. That's where I got a lot of information and drawings of like the jellyfish's life cycle and anatomy and how nematocysts work. I hope the information is still accurate. It was published in like 
Oh, was it seriously published 18 years ago? Oh my god, my lifespan. Also, shout out to my patrons. Yes, we have two of them now. And they should be watching this video a few days before it gets released to the public. So if you're interested in early access to videos, getting your name in the credits, or you just want to support the work we do here on this channel, you can sign up for our Patreon over at patreon.com slash the octopus lady. But if you don't have the cashy money for that, it's okay. I, I don't either. You can always like, comment, share, and subscribe. And tune in next time, we'll be talking about sea cucumbers. And until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens.